I would like to invite Professor Gillian to share his thoughts with us in his keynote address, The Future of Water. Honorable Governor, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, friends, and I recognize many friends in the audience. First of all, it's a great privilege to have been invited by the Hissar Foundation, who I've heard of, but I've met for the first time, and I'm immensely impressed. So I would like to congratulate them, certainly on my behalf, for organizing such an extraordinary event and for the work that they do, the insightful, thoughtful, and critically important work that they're doing. I'm a teacher now, so forgive me if I'm a bit teachy, um, but there are many things that I know about Pakistan that I care about. Um, I've been working here off and on for the last 40 years, and my father was actually born in Pakistan, so he was born in Lahore, so I have connections that go back to 1921. Um, some of you in the room will know this man. This was John Briscoe. John wrote extraordinary stuff about Pakistan. He was a great supporter. He, he um, wrote the report for the Friends of Democratic Pakistan. Um, he wrote this report, Pakistan, Pakistan's Water Economy Running Dry, a, a World Bank document. And John always said, and I say the same thing, never say anything with which a reasonable person cannot disagree. In, in this spirit, if I say anything that everybody agrees, be sorry, because my intention is to provoke. And my intention in my presentation is to provoke, and I do it with respect. I mean, I recognize the challenges that you face. This is John two months before he died, receiving the Stockholm Water Prize from the king in, 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 in Sweden. Um, and he died exactly two months later, a, a, a serious cancer. Um, breaking news, which I often do as a teacher, I, this is all... This is Saturday, um, Indo-Pakistan Peace Central Prosperity in the region. Uh, Pakistan dip diplomat talks about Pakistan's water-related challenges. Pakistan depends for the bulk of its surface water supply on the Indus River Basin. Pakistani and Indian government should encourage greater interaction between institutions dealing with water issues, as well as encourage civil society participation in water-related discourse. And I can't think of a better group to try and do that than the Hissar Foundation. Can Pakistan es escape a dry future? This is another op-ed on the same day in the same newspaper. So your newspapers are full of these kinds of messages. We live on the only blue planet that we know exists. When looking back from Mars, the first astronauts looked back, they said, we can see a blue planet. It's the only blue planet we can see. And if we look at the blue planet, we have a lot of 97.5% of that is in the oceans. Only 0.01% is lakes, swamps, and rivers. And most, most terrestrial life depends on that. Groundwater also critically important. But what's going to happen if the climate predictions are correct? What's going to happen to the 1.72%? Is it all going to go into the ocean? Certainly as the great glaciers carve off the Antarctic and the Arctic, they're going straight into the ocean to become salt water. So we lose that, that portion, and we're down to 0.8% in total. Now, I, this is a difficult slide. I wanted to show it, and I was encouraged to do so, because the theory of human development and evolution is because of complex water. Why did all early hominids emerge out of Africa? Africa hasn't moved with regard to the equator. And we've got several things happening on this graph. First of all, the blue over five million years are, sh are lakes. Um, the the, the um, red lines, the vertical lines, are major dispersal out of Africa. And what we have here, so lakes, the second is, is speciation, hominid diversity. And the third is brain size, encephalization, the size of the cranium. And what we can see here, this is Homo sapiens only in the last 50, 60, 70,000 years. 70,000 years ago, Homo sapiens, humans, our direct ancestors were here in Pakistan. So pulsed variability, the rise and fall of lakes, the absence and the presence of water, complex climates result in human development and human evolution in Africa 
and then movement out, dispersal from that. And if we look at this here, we can see that 70,000 years ago we had people, Homo sapiens, humans, our ancestors here in South Asia, um, but not until 40,000 years ago in Northern Europe. Northern Europe's story was partly because of ice, and glaciation. And we had four great river civilizations five, six, seven thousand years ago. The first on the Nile, the second in, in um, Mesopotamia, the land between two rivers, that's what it means. Um, so the Tigris and the Euphrates. The third here in the Indus. And the fourth on the Yellow and Yangtze River in China. These, these were the great civilizations of that time. You were far ahead of anybody else. Just very quickly, the Nile, and I spent a lot of time working on Nile cooperation, the Nile gods, the Nilometer. And the Nilometer is extraordinary because if the water levels are too high, taxes turn, go down to zero. If the water level is too low, taxes to zero. If the water level is median, maximum taxes. And this is how taxes were determined all the time in the Nile, in the Nile Delta during its, its, great, its, its period of greatness. This is the Nile. Um, cooperative mechanism that is underway, but nevertheless there is this in the press in the last few days. Um, yeah, that was I think last month. So dispute and, and we're not going to have conflict, but serious dispute between Egypt and Ethiopia because Ethiopia upstream is, is building a large dam. Excuse me. The Tigris <coughs> and Euphrates. Um, this is Nineveh, Mosul, extraordinary city, um, much destroyed in the, in the recent fighting. That, that's the Gilgamesh tablets. Um, now, now Iraq. This here, this image is, I think this is 30 years ago. This is, this is fertile land and vegetation. This is the same land um, recently. And because of salination, the fertility of the land has dropped close to zero. This is salt being taken off the land. You, you can grow nothing with that. This is one of my photographs. That's me. I'm working on the Tigris and Euphrates, trying to encourage cooperation with Syria, Iran, Turkey, um, and Iraq. Sorry, I mean, that, that's, that, that's what I sleep in. And, and that's the, those are the accompanying vehicles when you're going to meetings. So um, this is dispute. Now, the Indus. Um, Mohenjo-daro and I went there many, many years ago, and I want to go back. Uh, this extraordinary city with hot water, with sewers, with, with um, uh, bakery on 6,000 years ago. Long before we had civilization anywhere else but in these great, great basins. Um, wells, um, hot baths, but, but this is 2010, the same country. India and Pakistan, water tensions escalate to The Hague. So dispute. Let me, I'll come back to that. The lesson for humanity, societies and leaders that manage water become powerful. Societies and leaders that stop managing water lose power and collapse. Um, water security, it's the, a key goal of societies and leaders. Leaders must understand that obligation. History will not record their greatness unless they can prevent the kind of collapse we've seen. And there are many much more recent examples. So water security, very quickly, a source of life, production, growth and cooperation, healthy people, healthy ecosystems, food production, energy production, navigation, cult its cultural value and cooperation. And on the flip side of this coin, water, a cause of death, destruction, poverty and dispute, drought, flood and inundation, Landslides, destruct desertification, contamination, epidemic and disease, and dispute even conflict. And all of these, all of these are happening in the world today. So it's an enduring human goal, ancient wisdom, Chinese saying, Xu Neng, neng Zaiju, Yi Neng, Fuzhu, which means not only can water float a boat, it can sink it also. There's lots of wisdoms in the Chinese language about water, because again, China is founded. On, on a water culture. It's a true hydraulic society, as is, as is Pakistan. Uh, nature can help and harm you. 
So just quickly, I, I don't want to spend too long on definitions. We define it. The sim I've been involved in defining what is security for 20 years now. This, for me, is the simplest. It's about, it's about security, which is confidence, freedom from danger, risk, want, anxiety, fear, and doubt. Tolerable means the point at which you would spend the next dollar or rupee you have on the next risk. So it's when you're very poor and you've got lots of risks, you can't afford to spend much on any of them. And water-related risks to the benefits of water, to water supply and sanitation and so on, and of the impacts of water, drought, flood and pollution, and society from the family all the way up to the nation state to the region. Freedom from intolerable water-related risk and freedom to pursue otherwise constrained social and economic opportunities. Our hypothesis now demonstrated clearly is that water-related risks inhibit growth and inhibit stability, military stability, political stability inhibited by water insecurity. And it's, it's, uh, it's dynamic, it's exogenous, because as we have climate change and population growth, these numbers change. And tolerability, of, as, you, as you grow, people become less, toler less, less tolerant with risks. They want they will not accept floods, they will not accept polluted water, they will not accept poor people have no choice but to accept. So just quickly, a model of growth, wealth and well-being is a target, the water endowment of surface and groundwater, destructive impacts, the risk of those impacts, productive uses, the opportunity that creates, the investments that are made in, in information institutions and infrastructure, both productive investments and protective investments, and as you grow, you increase the value of assets at risk. So the floods, for example, in New York and, and in New Orleans over the last decade or so hit the, the, the financial cost of the, was enormous because of the value of assets in the United States. I'm going to talk about seven challenges quickly. Um, endowment, first of all. The headline risk is variability plus unpredictability plus change equals complexity. And Pakistan is very high on the complexity score. You have a very, very complex climate water system. Much, much more complex than most of the wealthy countries in the world. And there is a correlation between complexity and poverty. And, and this, forgive the, forgive the strange graphic, but it is a graphic that actually, it's a piece of work we've done at Oxford. And, and this is investment in, in water institutions and infrastructure. And this is a complexity um, figure, essentially. It's about the coefficient of variation of monthly runoff. And these are, these are poor countries. These are rich countries. And what we see is that most rich countries have simple hydrology. It's not complex and have spent a lot of money. Most poor countries have complex hydrology and have spent very little money. So they're down here, and they're across here. So there's, again, an inverse relationship. Rich countries spend a great deal more on this, and they have a small problem. And, and the reasons are obvious, but one of the reasons why countries are poor is because they, they occupy a space in which the water resources are complex to understand, to predict, and to manage. Um, that's actually the, the, the Indus. That's the Ganges. There is a difference, and the difference is a significant part of this flow is, is, is glacier melt. That only 4% of the, of the Ganges flow is glacier melt, and it's more like 40% of the Indus flow. Um, so let me, let's look at some of these. The, uh, India and Pakistan, uh, I couldn't get the Pakistan numbers, so forgive me. It, it, the Pakistan numbers are slightly below India, but India is producing at significantly below a good performer in terms of yields of wheat and rice and so on. So your, your productivity is relatively low. Water and sanitation, 800 million globally, 2.6 million without toilets. Um, with 7 billion people would have to do things differently. We cannot do it the way we're doing it now in, big, in cities. But I'm going to come back to this because, frankly, I'm going to provoke. I'm going to provoke. This is a disgrace. So girls don't go to schools if there are no toilets. And often the toilet block is a boy's block and a girl's block, it's mixed and all the doors are down. So girls, certainly going into puberty, they don't go to school. Family, and I'm gonna say why it's critical, it's critical to educate girls. This is last month 
education sinned, suffers due to poor sanitation. I'm being provocative. Um, if we look at the population, 35 million at partition, it could be 500 million. The current UN project projections are 350 million by 2100. But it could, go to, it could go to 500 million. And it will go to 500 million if you don't have toilets for girls and women. If you, because you will not educate them. And if we look at the per capita water availability as a direct consequence of this growth of population, which is partly a consequence of not respecting girls and women, your water stress you were until about, 90, about 2000 or thereabouts, you are in absolute scarcity now. You've gone below the line in Pakistan. Water is absolutely scarce as a, and these are, these are global standards. You're there already. Flood risks, this major flood, and I was living in Delhi at this time, um, very little in the newspapers about it. There was more, more in the newspapers in India about a minor flood in, in the UK where one person drowned because his car was washed away than there was about these floods on the Ganges where we had 4,500 dead, um, 70 million affected, and this was in the Indian press. Um, Pakistan, which has already been mentioned, but the 2010 monsoon followed by the 2011 floods, followed by the 2012 floods. Three years of flooding. There's been quite a lot in the intelligence blogosphere about the, the recruiting of fundament, by fundamentalist groups. There's also a lot of very interesting literature that actually the people that were affected here, the people that were affected in these floods have become better civic society members. They vote more. They're concerned more about the leadership. Um, so let me move on. Um, local drought risks. Now, and this is going on right now, Somalia. 350,000 in dead-end camps. 29,000 under fives died in 90 days. Um, the Russian drought, by the way, exactly the as the Pakistan floods just across the Himalayas are blocking a climate feature that we don't fully understand that, that, that meant drought in Russia that was incredibly serious, and I'll say why, and floods in Pakistan. But the temperature in the last month in Baluchistan was 53.5 degrees. That's the fourth highest temperature ever recorded on this planet, ever. And this is absolutely exceptional, but it's happened now several times in Pakistan over the last few years. And you can't survive at this temperature. <clears throat> so transboundary risks, um, the, the Indus is on the list of the, of, the, of the most difficult. And I spent a lot of my career working on transboundary water and bringing parties together. China shares 111 rivers and lakes with 17 neighboring countries and has a treaty only with one country, with Russia, on one minor tributary. Otherwise, no treaties, no agreements. Um, so, so spillovers, just very quickly. The Syria drought, four years of drought, we know that that drought resulted in people going into the cities of Aleppo and Damascus, etc. They were, uh, were hoping for work. They left their wives and children behind um, to, to try and tend animals to keep them alive. The animals died. There was no work for them in the cities. They rioted. The, the, the police came out. The army came out. The new Syrian army was, was created. And civil, civil war in Syria led to Russia and the, and, and the United States facing each other in the Mediterranean because of that battle. And at the, at the start of it, it was drought. Um, wheat prices here, historic highs. Um, most of the wheat going into North Africa is Russian wheat. The Russian banned export of, they, they banned export of wheat um, on August the 4th, 2010. Um, the price doubled in North, on the North African coast by the end of the year. Early in, in, in January 2011, rioting on the streets in Tunisia, a young uh, bread seller uh, immolated himself, burned himself to death. Within two weeks, the government fell in Tunisia. Three weeks later, rioting in Tahir Square. Now, I'll come back to this point in a moment, led to the fall of Mubarak, also bread prices being part of the trigger. There was 
there was a much deeper malaise. It wasn't just bread prices, but the bread price was the trigger for regime change. <clears throat> so this again is part of our work, and we can see here that if we look at the top 10 countries for people at risk of water insecurity, I've done India and Green, but Pakistan is, is on every one of those lists. 10 countries in the world, Pakistan is on the list, on the list of all, of, of, for all three of these in terms of, of what needs to be done. Um, so I'm going to go on through this. If we, this is the World Economic Forum. So every year, um, the World Economic Forum sends out questionnaires to 500 of the, great, of the, of the, of the most substantial businesses in this world, and they, and they rate what they see as threats to business. And water was up there, this is 2011. In 2014, water's gone up, up there with fiscal crises. 50 is at the top, this scale on this side is, is the impact in billions of dollars, and this scale on this side is the likelihood. And 2016, we've got large-scale involuntary migration, failure of climate change mitigation, adaptation, and water crises. This is what worries businesses. So you're looking for inward investment. If you hit any of those buttons, you're unlikely to get it. And this great river, it, the Indus is Pakistan. Pakistan is the Indus. That's who you are. Um, many people write about this fact that the absence of any cooperative activity in this region, not, a, it not only does it create a security risk, it's an economic crisis as well. And when we look at trade, for example, South Africa has the lowest intra-regional trade in the world. This top red line here, this is intra between in the region in East Asia, and that's South Asia. No trade. Um, and that's a measure of economic efficiency. Well, just, um, yeah, I, on every one of these metrics, South Asia is, is troubled in terms of the scale of the challenge. This is climate-induced degradation, climate-induced increase in storms, um, food production, environmentally induced migration. It's, all of them are in South Asia. Um, just let's look at the Indus and compare it to the other South Asian rivers. Um, it's first in terms of the amount of water that's contributed by glaciers. So snowmelt plays a greater contribution in the Indus than in any other river basin. It's third in terms of its, of its population. This is old data, I'm afraid, from Isimod. And it's seventh in terms of its cubic meter per, per capita per year. Very little water per capita. It has a large population and has a great deal of contribution from snowmelt, from the third pole. Um, I'm, I'm going to skip this because I actually, this is, these are my challenges. This is what has been overcome. This is what needs to be overcome. Um, this is some of the, some of the suggestions, the, the, some of the modeling, and I'm not sure I believe any of this. There hasn't been good work and there needs to be good work and perhaps the university in partnership in, in Pakistan can, and that is the consequences of snowmelt and what it means in terms of, of river flows. But this suggests that the Indus may, may fall by 40% if there is substantial snow melting. Um, I'm going to skip this too. This is the US intelligence community assessment. That's Pakistan actually lifted from, from this map. And that's the 2025 future that's lifted from in extremely more stressed and exceptionally more stressed categories. So it's as, it's as difficult as it gets, and this is threats to the United States. So, a century revolution. Um, the imperative of that, you've had a 20th century revolution, you did wonderful things in the 20th century. Um, in the 1960s, post-partition, you gathered great people across Pakistan, and you delivered by 1960, by the time the treaty went into effect, you delivered everything you needed in terms of the link canals, the storages, and, and, and other investments. You've got to have another revolution. Um, 
this just quickly. So where might this be? Um, all of these things. It was, it was the Tennessee Valley, um, and it was the kind of turnaround that took place in a couple of decades. That's FDR and his vision. Um, so in a generation, all of this gone. Um, and it's possible to do that. Now, the US transferred, obviously, a lot of internal funds to achieve that. I'm going to skip this. So I actually have this in my room upstairs. Uh, I was going to wave it. Didn't think I would have time. My interest here, partly, is that this was written in the month of the year in which I was born, August 1951. I was born then. Um, I want to spend a minute on these disputes. So this is Kalabach. And I wanted, sorry, I, that, that, that comes next, I beg your pardon. Um, yeah, this, this is, this is the, the, the Kalabag dispute between Sindh and, and, and Punjab, and I don't understand why you couldn't have a cooperative ownership with municipalities and provincial governments as shareholders with an asset holding company, with an operating company, with a regulator and bulk buyers and customers. Um, so from provincial assets to interprovincial assets, an institutional option to build trust and to share benefits. Because then you determine what the releases are. You determine what, what is stored. All of you determine. It's not up to the Punjab to do that. Sindh has an absolutely equal role to play. It's purely a geographic location. Now, the Baglihar difference. This is the first dispute with India that went to the International Court for Arbitration. Um, and the Indus Waters Treaty declares that there must be minimum live storage. Storage. Um, but, and that's dead storage. Now, what Baglihar allowed was new live storage because the neutral expert said this is practice. You must store the sediment and flush it. And Pakistan didn't do a very good job of arguing against that. But it became clear with the with the, with the, with the Kishan Ganga dispute. So the project was allowed with low gates for flushing, adding live storage, which could be used to stop river flows. And this ruling went against Pakistan in favor of India. Now, the next one was the Kishan Ganga dispute in 2003. Arbitration. Sorry, I beg your pardon. The first one was a neutral expert. I beg your pardon, because it was, to, it was a difference. And a difference is a different interpretation of the articles of the treaty. This is a dispute. A dispute is where you, you disagree to the application of the articles of the treaty. Now, in, in, Kishin, in Kishin Ganga, um, fairly soon, we had India declaring victory, and we had Pakistan really angry, um, demanding the government fix responsibilities and roll heads. Um, but there's something behind this, and John Briscoe picked it up. I mean, here, here he is winning the battle but losing the war while allowing India to build Kishan Ganga. They were not allowed to build the live storage. And India complained bitterly about this because if you don't build live storage, the life of your dam and the cost of your investment and the, and the rate of return on them, that investment is much lower. So the incentive to build dams is much, much lower because of this ruling. This is... Swami Ayer, he was the Water Secretary of India, retired, and he's saying in his article, John Briscoe makes some valid points about the Kishan Ganga award, and he goes on to argue, can we afford to build dams with this ruling in Kashmir? So this ruling overturned the ruling of Baglihar, because Baglihar was incorrect. It was an incorrect application of the treaty by the neutral expert, who did not understand the political challenge of storage in, on the India side, where that storage can be used in a hostile way to withhold flows into, in, into Pakistan. So the project allowed low gates, added live storage, not allowed. Now, I don't want to take time with this, but these, these two pieces, here's Briscoe saying, for goodness sake, why don't you try and do something together? That will make a big difference. And here's Ra Ramaswamy Iyer saying, Briscoe's suggestion of joint and collaborative undertakings is welcome, but he thinks it's unlikely to happen because of Pakistan. Um, so I, I'm going to, because of time, this is all about why, the, how, how you share benefits, why you share benefits, um, and this is based on a whole lot of examples, um, how different ways in which you share benefits, direct payment for water use for benefits, purchase agreements, co-financing, co-ownership agreements, 
broaden bundles of benefits. Um, but let me just place a few places, put a few places on this. The Indus is right over here, so unilateral action, but it has a treaty and a commission at least. On the communication and information sharing, the Rhine converging national agendas, the Orange, which is South Africa, Lesotho, much further over, there's joint planning and joint investment. Senegal joint equity ownership. Um, and these are game changers. So this is, this is Paraguay, Brazil, this is the Lesotho Highlands, Lesotho, South Africa, this is the Mantali, Mali, Mauritania, Senegal, and, and now Guinea, 350 kilometers inside Mali, owned sovereign ownership of four states. Um, now, uh, this is recent press, so this is um, June, June, this is the joining of, of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, this is Pakistan-India cooperation beyond the river, um, the Iran-Pakistan-India pipeline, that's March 2000, 2017, these discussions continue, whether they're ever likely to happen, who knows, but whether this sort of dialogue is a good idea, I would certainly recommend it. I mean, your management of the Indus, your development of the Indus, your, your dependence on the Indus depends on having friends. You can, pick your, you can pick your friends, but you cannot pick your neighbors. The challenge is to make your neighbor your friend. So, um, I'm just about done. Um, a river plus a dike, this is Chinese script, equals good management, governance, and political order. So you manage the river, you've got, good, you've got political order. Um, my last, essentially major, in, so this is, this is managing complex, major investments, uh, meeting massive demand, high priority safe sanitation, especially for girls in schools. Um, so thank you very much. I just leave this one for you to read by someone who I've met several times and admire, Gorbachev. Thank you, Professor Gray.